Hey guys, this is Spinda for GroundSchool.com with part four of my four part lecture plus live play series on beating small and micro stakes, six max, no limit hold'em. Uh, this video, wrapping up the series, is going to be on adjusting to certain player types uh, and the more typical types of players you're going to see at the lower limits. Before we get going, I want to discuss a little bit about just basically what is adjusting. And we can look at a few definitions of the term uh, and talk about how it relates to poker. The first is to change so as to match or fit. Basically that means uh, we can, uh, we're can we trying to, like you see in the second definition, adapt or conform as to new conditions. So adjusting in terms of anything really, uh, but in terms of poker, is going to be uh, to adjust to the type of players we're playing against in a way to make our uh, our play as profitable as it can be. Um, and we'll talk about, in this video, different player types. Uh, we'll talk about exploiting their tendencies and adjusting to their tendencies. Um, so the question is, why is adjusting so important? And you know, why do we hear a lot about it? Uh, and, uh, you know, why should you care, you know, that you need to adjust? And the first thing is that it helps, I mean, number one thing, is it helps improve your win rate. I and mean, plain and simple, if we can adjust to our opponent's tendencies, we're going to be able to make uh, more correct decisions. We're going to be able to make more plus CV plays. And all in all, that's going to help to improve your win rate. Uh, and I think also uh, one of the bigger keys is that it's very important in terms of moving up levels. Uh, as you move up, move up through levels, you're going to be finding uh, less really bad fish and more kind of taggy regulars and like tag fish and players that play fairly tight but maybe aren't that great post flop but you'll also be finding some really good lags and some really good tags as well at each level uh, and the more you're able to adjust to those player types and exploit their tendencies uh, the easier it's going to be uh, to move up through the levels and uh, to constantly be improving your win rate and building your bankroll so adjusting is, is very key we've already talked about all three of these other uh, videos, certain things that you know, we are certain things that we are adjusting. We talked about in continuation betting, uh, how we would adjust our continuation bet size or percentage, you know, versus different player types. We talked about in position how we would adjust the range of hands we're opening due to players on our left or our right. So we've already talked about adjusting a little bit, but in this video we're going to go uh, way into detail. And the first thing we have to do is we have to typecast our opponents. Uh, and that's what we see here. Uh, there's, for the sake of this video, I'm going to list four um, major opponent types. Uh, the first is going to be your tighter regulars, uh, and we can deem those as tags or nits. For the sake of this video, I'm going to lump them into one group. Uh, and uh, when we're discussing a, a tag or a net, we're talking about someone with a VPIP range of 12 to 20 percent. And now, for those who don't understand VPIP, it stands for voluntarily put money into the pot. I guess there could be a dollar sign in there somewhere. Uh, but basically, a player playing anywhere from 12 to 20% of his hands at six maximum limit is quite tight pre-flop. Uh, and then with a pre-flop uh, raising percentage range or somewhere in the 6 to 15% range, it's fairly passive. Right? If we have someone that's running like 15-9 at six max, that's a very weak, tight kind of opponent. Uh, while uh, someone like maybe running 20-15 is probably on the very good side of being a winning tag regular. I mean, that's a, those are probably pretty darn good stats at uh, six max no limit. The next category we'll talk about are players that will give you a lot of trouble. These are probably the best players at all the levels. They're the best hand readers and they probably have the highest win rates and those are the loose aggressive regulars. Uh, at six max this is players with VPIPs in the range from anywhere from 20 to 35 percent or so and preflop raises range anywhere from 18 to 30 percent. So you know, your typical lag might be someone running like 27, 22 at six max. I mean that would probably be your average lag. Uh, there's our, our people that are running more than 30 percent VPIP and running somewhere in like the in the upper 20s preflop raise. And those are the very, very loose aggressive regulars. And if they're very good hand readers, chances are they're like the, they're the best players at each stake. Um, and these are the toughest players to adjust to. And so we'll probably go into detail on, you know, the ways we can uh, exploit some of their tendencies or maybe minimize uh, their edge on us. 
The next category is one of the players we make the most amount of money from at the table, and that's the loose passive fish. Uh, this player tends to play a large variety of hands from all positions and tends to do so pretty passively. I would say that the majority of these players are going to have a VPIP at 30% or higher and a preflop raising range like in like the single digits. So that would be the pure definition of someone that's loose but also passive. And these players are very extremely easy to exploit and uh, easy to adjust to. However, I see a lot of people making the in making incorrect adjustments to these types of players, uh, and sometimes it drives me nuts. But so hopefully after this video, most of you guys will understand exactly how you should be playing against uh, these type of opponents, and therefore you'll be making much better decisions against them. And the final category is going to be the overall overly loose or aggressive uh, maniac type player. And this guy shows up every now and then at your table playing just a ton of pots um, and raising a lot of them as well. And this person, uh, when running well, can be really annoying to deal with. However, uh, there are some really key uh, adjustments we need to make to fully exploit the fact that they're just playing way too wide and weak of a range from all positions. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take time to look at, analyze each player type, uh, and then go into detail on exactly how we should adjust against that certain player type. Uh, so first we must understand how they play, and then secondly we must talk about adjustments to exploiting those styles. So first up on our list is going to be the tag or the knit. Uh, and first before we can uh, talk about adjusting to these players, let's break down other uh, tendencies just a little bit more before we get into ex adjusting and exploiting. Um, so let's first hit look at you know why the tag wins money, uh, and it's fairly obvious, but it's it's worth going over. He plays a very strong hand range. I guess I should say he or she plays a strong hand range uh, pre-flop. You know when we're talking about someone with a VPIP in the range of like 12 to 20 percent, that's you know generally going to have very strong holdings. Uh, and that's going to make it easy for them to be value betting on later streets, making big hands, and stacking players. Uh, brings me to my next point is they tend to only stack off of big hands, right? Uh, top pair, top kicker, plus may, maybe even strong, has to be stronger than that for some of the nittier players. So when they're con when they're only getting their money in with like very strong hands, they're tending they'll tend to make a lot of money in those spots. Um, in a lot of the tags, they tend to play fairly aggressively. Uh, while they're not playing a wide range of hands, when they do play, they're generally raising. And uh, you know, we know that playing aggressively is one of the keys to winning in poker. Uh, but there's also ways that the tag could certainly uh, make more money. And I think the biggest thing is they need to open their game up in later position. They tend to play way too tight from the cutoff and the button, which doesn't put them in a lot of profit, doesn't allow them to be in as many profitable post-flop spots as they could be in. You know, they'd rather just uh, minimize their variance and continue to play their very tight uh, style of play instead of opening up. And another point is they could be isolating uh, the fish or the bad players a lot more often. I see way too many tags um, just losing the battle in terms of fighting for the fish's money. Uh, whereas we know that we should be isolating the fish a lot. We should be trying to take pots in position, heads up with the fish the majority of the time. And I think a lot of the tags or nits out there just do a really poor job of accomplishing that. So, and then we've broken down the tag. Let's talk about you know possible ways to adjust uh, to their style of play. Uh, so the first way is to exploit the fact that they play very tight preflop. And there's a few easy ways to exploit this tendency. Uh, number one is going to be to just to be constantly stealing their blinds when. If we're table selecting and, and seat selecting properly, it would be really great to have one or two tag or nits right on our left. Or I'm sorry, not, I don't want to say right on our left, immediately to our left. Uh, because this makes stealing blinds extremely easy. If we think about it in a mathematical sense, if both players have a, a fold to button steal from the small and big blind of somewhere in like the 85 to 90 percent range, which is somewhat typical for really like tight players, uh, our button steals are going to work in anywhere in the range of like 65 to 80 percent of the time, uh, which is obviously going to be profitable in the long run. So constantly stealing their blinds, opening probably 75 percent of hands on the button when it's folded to us and we have two nitty players in the blinds is certainly going to be immediately profitable. Another way uh, that we can 
take advantage of their preflop tightness is by opening really wide from the cutoff when these players are on the button. Uh, just plain and simple, they're not going to be flat. They're not going to be calling or raising. I guess calling or three betting enough from the button to make it. Uh, incorrect for us to be opening very wide from the cutoff. What this allows us to do is to steal more blinds, to steal the button basically, and if there are fish in the blinds, it allows us to play a lot of pots in position with the fish, whereas the, the play on the button, the tag should be trying to do that, and he's not. He's just going along, playing his way too many tables and way too tight of a style. Another thing uh, we can do uh, to, to exploit their preflop tightness is definitely to stack off tighter preflop. Uh, at lower levels against really nitty players, hands like, we probably cannot profit, profitably felt a hand like pocket queens, unfortunately, as, as tight as that sounds. And a hand like ace king may not even be profitable enough to stack off with in some spots against certain players. Now, I'm not going to say this as a whole against every tag. I mean, some tags do three bet light. Some tags do get the money in a little bit lighter than others. But against a lot of your nittier players, you should really respect when they start putting a lot of money in before the flop. Because it's generally going to be... Uh, a, a range of at the worst like two queen you know queens plus an ace king and could be even tied as just kings or aces um so you know with that in mind uh if they have such a really tight stacking off range preflop we can actually go ahead and three bet pretty light when we're in position against the tags although they do a couple things incorrectly some will just fold way 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 too often to three bets when they're out of position which to be honest is not really that bad uh, but the other tendency they'll typically have is they'll call way too much preflop with like speculative hands, medium pocket pairs, and and maybe some pseudo connectors or like hands like ace jack maybe even, and then they'll be check folding and tum post flop. So uh, one way to exploit the fact that they just uh, they fold way too much preflop to any kind of aggression would be to 3-bet them wider when we are in position. We can 3-bet them when we're out of position as well. We just have to be careful uh, because it's just much tougher to play 3-bet pots when we're out of position. All right. uh, we can also adjust to the tag by exploiting their uncreative post-flop play, and this is my favorite. Uh, while pre-flop is fun and good, it's only one street of poker. You know, With post-flop play, we have three streets of poker, and uh, the one thing I like to do, one of the things I like to do, is apply pressure when their range is weak. Um, basically, they're playing very fit or fold poker post-flop, meaning they're either going to have hit a hand and willing to continue with it, or they've bricked, either they've tried to set mine and they missed, or they didn't flop top pair better, and they're just going to be giving up pretty easily. Um, so when we feel like their range is pretty weak in spots, we should really be applying a lot of pressure, whether that be uh, betting the flop and the turn, two barreling a lot, maybe even three barreling, or bluff raising some flops when we know that the range of hands they're going to continue with is very small. And that's great because this player tends to fold a lot. And we can exploit the, their tendency to fold too much by applying a pressure uh, with a wide range of hands. Uh, one other thing, we've got a couple left, but I like to say give them credit when credit is due. Uh, these types of players are typically not going to be uh, bluffing a ton post-flop. And when they do bluff, it's generally going to be very, very strong draws as semi-bluffs. So when these players start waking up on later streets like the Turner River and start putting in a lot of money, we're going to need to give them credit for strong hands. Um, so because of that, uh, you know, we're going to have to fold on the turn of river when we maybe get check raised all in or, or an opponent raises a turn bet uh, just because the range we're doing so is very tight but it's also very strong and it's not balanced at all from the tag it's going to generally just be uh, a value raise or a value shove they're really never doing it as bluffs on later streets um, and one of the things I love doing against the tag is to get them out of their comfort zone and uh, as you can see here I'm good at typos um, so I'll run through this again. Uh, we're going to get them out of their comfort zone. And there's a few ways to do this. My favorite way is to min-raise the button when they're in the blinds, especially the big blind. Uh, what this ends up doing is it forces the tag to either allow us to steal their blinds ridiculously cheaply, or it forces them to play a lot, of more, a lot more pots out of position against us, which is probably the better benefit. Uh, while stealing their blinds is great, if we can start forcing tags to play a lot of pots out of position against us, we're just going to own them constantly post-flop. So this is one way to get them out of their comfort zone. Another way to get them out of their comfort zone is just to alter our bet sizes on certain streets um, to just like non-standard bet sizes. Uh, whether this is like half-potting the flop or un like one-third 
C betting the flop or it's like over betting the turn but not as a shove or whether it's making like smallish three bet sizes in position pre flop. Any way where we can get them to be uncomfortable and to put them in spots they're not used to being in is going to end up being extremely profitable for us uh, just because they're used to playing this cookie cutter style of poker where they see bet. They give up on the turn if they miss, they bet if they hit, etc. Um, and if we can start putting them to a lot more decisions than they're used to making, we're going to be fairly certain that they're going to make the incorrect decision. And generally, if they make the correct one, it's usually by luck of the draw, in all honesty. So the more decisions we can put them to that they're not used to making, uh, it's going to put us in much more profitable situations. So while the tag and the knit are probably the person you're going to make the least amount of money off of uh, by adjusting, it's certainly worth talking about some of the adjustments. Because as you move up to like 100 no limit and plus, your tables, the majority of your tables are going to have three or four of these players on them. It's just hard to find a table with more than like one true fish, uh, one or two true fish nowadays, like 100 no limit six max, unless you're playing on some really fishy European site. So because of that, we need to learn how to make the most money from these players that we can. And these are just some simple ways to do it. Next up, we'll talk about probably the hardest player to adjust to, and that's going to be uh, the lag. So discussing the lag, uh, I think it's going to be pretty interesting because it's a player that we should all almost be uh, aspiring to be because typically these are the better players at your levels. These are the players with you know bigger win rates. They, they do have some higher variance, but they're also going to be you know, some of the better poker players around. So let's talk about why they're so good, why they win money, why they're able to have such big win rates. And I think a few of the things are they really exploit their positional advantage at the table. Uh, more so than anyone around, they're going to be playing the majority of their hands um, from later position, and that's going to help them do a few things. Uh, obviously, it's going to help them uh, pounce on weakness. They tend to really take advantage of players who are showing weakness and uh, are willing to give up pots. And obviously that's much easier to do when we're in position versus out of position. Um, playing so much in position also helps them um, hand read a lot better. And all we all know that we like we talked about um, in that last video on position is that the more information we have on our opponents, the easier it is to put them on the correct hand. Therefore, uh, by the the fact that they're playing the majority of their hands when they're in position just helps them become, you know, very good hand readers. Uh, they also tend to semi bluff and, and outright bluff uh, with a great frequency, and and they do so in correct spots. Um, these are the kind of players that have a lot of variance in their game. However, and you know, when they're running good, they're pretty much impossible to beat. Uh, when they run bad, they have some pretty big swings, but that's because generally they're stacking off a lot of draws as well as strong hands, um, and that's just going to bring some added variance to their game. There are a few spots where I think that lags could potentially improve their play. Uh, I think one thing I see as we're moving through limits is they get into too many preflop battles with some of the tighter regulars. You might hear this coined as reg wars sometimes, but I think they tend to stack off just too light against like the unadjusting tag nits. You know, the players um, who are still only stacking off of like queens and better and ace king, it's really easy once you're playing very laggy and you're opening a ton of pots to convince yourself that people are actually starting to play back at you in terms of like the tight regulars. The problem is that as a generalization, they're really they really are not playing back at you nearly as much as you think they are. Therefore, um, I think I see way too many lags get into these epic kind of pre-flop four bet five betting wars um, at lower stakes poker where they could just really avoid a lot of variance in their game in that sense. However, it does um, it does make the money in the long run in terms of being aggressive pre-flop and w taking down a lot of pots pre-flop with like the worst hand. And I think another thing is lags could do a little bit better by not trying to bluff the fish so much. I see it way too much where you have a loose aggressive player who's pretty good at poker um, and really dominates like the regulars and the tags well and could just do a lot better from learning to just value town against the fish instead of constantly trying to bluff them and blow them out of pots. And it just kind of boils down to patience and, and waiting for a big hand against the fish. And we'll talk about that on a later slide. 
Okay, so the tag is definitely going to be one of the harder players to adjust to, and it's one of the players where we're probably not even looking, in a sense, to make a lot of money off of them. We're just looking to maybe minimize our losses or maybe to break even against uh, a really good regular. Um, I think the first thing is definitely seat selection, and the key here would be to stay off their, stay off of their right. Uh, the worst seat you can have at the table is to have the very loose, aggressive player on your left, especially when they know what they're doing. So even if you feel like... Um, there's a fish at the table you can win money from. There's there are tables where it's not even that profitable if there's a fish on them. I I remember watching some or reading some things about some of the higher stakes games that have been running. You know those hundred thousand uh, dollar you know five hundred one thousand blind games that run on full tilt a lot. And there are a lot of players that had possible seats in the game to play against some of the bigger fish, but they they were their seat was like immediately to the right of like Durr, who is probably the best element holding player in the world at the moment. Uh, and they just wouldn't take the seat. Because even though there's a fish sitting across the table who's probably going to donate a lot of money to the table, their just seat is so bad that they're going to be bleeding a lot of money to the better players on their left. So uh, there are you know times where there's a fish at your table where your seat is just really bad because the players on your left are very good and are very aware. Uh, and so the fact that we're going to be off the right means we should be sitting on their left a lot or as much as we can and we really want to apply pressure and play bigger pots against them when we are in position we really don't want to be getting into battles uh, like three betting wars uh, in spots where like they're opening on the button and we're three betting from the blinds unless we have very strong hands mainly because they're re rarely going to be folding preflop and they're going to put a lot of pressure on like the weak part of our range post flop and it's going to make it very difficult uh, to play properly out of position so while we're in position we want to apply a lot of pressure uh, and the lags will fold a decent amount to three bets preflop, and when they do continue, uh, we can at least play the three bet pot in position. One thing we can definitely do is try to own their wide preflop ranges, and basically what this means is we need to be stacking off slightly lighter against people like this preflop. Uh, in one video, we talked about in the past stacking off of like middle and small pocket pairs against three bets, and is it plus EV or not? And against this player type, it certainly is. I mean, it's going to bring a lot of variance to your game, but certainly hands like deuces through eights and like ace-jack and ace-queen, we can four-bet shove or four-bet and then call a shove with, um, and it's going to be plus EV in a lot of spots, and it's going to be a ton of high variance. However, it might be enough to slow down the lags or just own the fact that they're going to be three-betting really light and with a ton of hands that they're not willing to call a four-bet shove with. Uh, and hands like twos through eights have a lot of equity against the, the eventual range they will call it off with, which could include hands like ace king, ace queen, and maybe like jacks or tens and better. Um, our hands still don't. Our hand still has enough equity uh, added with the full equity we might have to be, you know, plus EV. And I, I see this a lot, but um, I see people free betting for value, and then like with like ace queen and maybe like two tens, and then don't want to stack off on a lag four bets, and that's just really incorrect. Against the lag, um, if we're free betting a hand for value, it should be a hand we pretty much have a good idea of what we're going to do with uh, if we get four bet. And generally, against these really loose aggressive players, if we have any kind of history with them, we're going to have to be uh, calling uh, calling or five bet shoving, you know, calling a four bet shove or five bet shoving over a small four bet. So hands like Ace queen, two nines, two tens, or you know, very good hands to three bet for value against them, and we're just gonna have to be willing to get the money in pre flop against these kind of players. Uh, another way to adjust to the tag or to exploit their tendencies is try to induce some bluffs post flop. Uh, and I put here a feigned weakness and then snap off bluffs. I think this is a great spot to do, uh, you know. To appear a weak, maybe like our medium strength hands, our top pair weak kicker, or maybe hand like two jacks on a king high board. Hands that uh, we're going to have a lot of trouble getting value out of ourselves are much better against the lag when we try to just get them to bluff multiple streets against us. And it's going to uh, it's gonna make your variance a little bit higher, but it's also a great way to maybe slow the lag down, uh, which is a good thing, I think, is to get them to be bluffing us less post-flop and maybe even tightening up their value betting range. Uh, and then the last thing is, if you really want to add some variance to your game, you just have to fight fire with fire. Um, the lags do have a little bit of trouble adjusting to like the tight players with tight preflop stats that start getting really aggressive on later streets, mainly because our range should be much stronger than their range, 
and uh, we know that when our range is a lot stronger than our opponent's range, we should tend to be playing a lot more aggressively. And when they have a really, really wide range, you know, raising range or three betting range or flat calling in position against one of our like an under the gun open, we should tend to play you know our hands very strongly, uh, whether we have a hand or not. And it's going to be tough for them uh, to play profitably post flop when our range is just so much stronger than theirs in certain spots. Uh, and then you just have to accept the variance against this type of player, uh, whether it be four bet shoving like those small to medium pocket pairs or ace queen, or whether it's stacking off with like top pair no kicker, or getting them with like two tens on a jack high board with a, when there's a flush draw out there. There's just a lot of spots where against the lags, uh, we're going to have to accept some of the variance that comes along with them playing very aggressively and building big pots. And a few of the ways we can help to minimize this is like we talked about trying to play the majority of our hands more in position uh, possibly paw controlling in spots where we wouldn't otherwise like spots where we definitely value betting fish and maybe like the uh, you know maybe some more maniacs against lags you might tend to play a little bit more paw control in spots and get like we talked about and do some bluffs on later streets from them instead of constantly like building you know constantly playing these big pots with like medium strength hands so the lag is definitely a person who's very tough to adjust to but and hopefully you look at this and we'll maybe see some spots later. Uh, it is definitely possible to adjust and to play some money poker against them. We just have to make sure that uh, the majority of the times we play pots with them, we're in position, we don't sit on the right, and we take advantage of their over-aggressiveness at times. So now that we've talked about the regulars, you'll see the tags, the nits, and the lags, it's time to really to focus on the fish and really how we can adjust to the fish and how... Uh, how profitable it can be if we're playing correctly against the bad players at the table. We're now getting to the player types where we can make a lot of money um, and where most of the money in poker comes from uh, is going to be the players who are playing way too wide of a range and playing their hands pretty poorly post-flop. Uh, so let's break down what uh, the typical fish uh, does that's just so incorrect. Uh, he plays passively. This is pretty obvious. They tend to uh, play very passively pre-flop and post-flop, uh, whether that be limp calling pre-flop or calling a lot of raises, and then also just check calling a ton post-flop, whether it be with strong hands, weak hands, draws, etc. Um, the fish also does not value bet well at all. Uh, the fish typically can cannot um, bet thinly at all. Plus, they also do a pretty poor job of building big pots with their big hands. You'll see them slow play way too often, and thus they'll get to the river and, let's just say, 25 no limit with like a $2 pot and like top set. Um, so because of this, uh, these are reasons why they just don't make as much money as they could, or they lose money. Um, they also tend to really check call a ton with their draws, or just call, maybe even in position with their draws, instead of semi-bluffing, check raising. When they do maybe raise a draw, it's typically like a min raise instead of a, a big raise, so they don't really apply a lot of pressure um, when they have, uh, when they flop draws. Um, another reason why the Fish is such a bad poker player is they play way too many hands from out of position. Whether this is like limping in from early position with speculative hands, or uh, it is calling just way, way, way too often from the blinds against like either late position raises or earlier posi position raises. They just play way too many hands out of position, which means that they lose a lot of pot control, like we saw from the last video. They lose value when they hit hands, and uh, they are unable to read their opponent's hand nearly well enough. The typical fish also stacks off just too lightly, um, not through aggression, but just from calling down. They they tend to get married to top pair type hands where we can go for three streets of value with our bigger hands and get a lot of money out of them. Uh, and they also have a trouble differentiating between big and small bets, especially on the river, where uh, they don't think about our range in a sense and what, you know what hands maybe we're jamming on the river versus what hands we might bet small with and they just tend to call way too big a bets on the river with like mediocre strength hands where they just think a really a bet is a bet and that's not the case you know they don't really consider their pot odds at all and what price they're getting in terms of calling you know big versus small river bets so there are many ways we're going to adjust to the fish and in all honesty this should be the easiest person to adjust to but I see way too many people uh, just flat out playing incorrect <laughs> against the fish, and it really, uh, some reason, it, like, this gets to me more than anything in poker, when I see someone, like, just completely playing incorrectly against, like, the worst players at the table. These should be the players that are easiest to exploit and to adjust. Uh, the first thing is going to be value, value, value. 
right? We want to get value out of players who have way too wide and weak of a range and call down way too light. So we're going to value bet them relentlessly. Um, this includes opening our value betting range in the Turner River. You know, hands we might typically paw control against a tag or a lag, we're certainly going to want to continue just to kind of go bet, bet, bet with against a lot of the fish. You know, um, top pair mediocre kicker. Uh, you know, I mean, even like media, like on four flush boards where we have like the fourth nut flush. I mean, there's just a lot of spots where these fish are going to call down way too light, and we're going to own them because we're able to value bet uh, thinly, but also properly against them. Another thing is we want to protect our medium strength hands against draws. You know, against other players who might be raising their draws a lot on the flop or turn, uh, the fish don't tend to play their hands in that manner. So we can, on a lot of draw heavy boards, we're going to want to be protecting like our our medium strength hands where we might paw control against some other players. All right, so this is just we need to value bet the fish. We need to exploit the tendency that they have way too wide of a range and they call down with way too way too many hands. You know, on the same. A level there, we certainly don't want to be bluffing the fish. It's if the main reason we make a lot of money from the fish is like we just talked about—they call down way too light. So obviously, this is a horrible person uh, to be bluffing. Uh, they just never ever fold. I mean, I, it's a strong word to say, never, but they just rarely fold. So making bluffs like past continuation betting flops, I would, I, I think, is just really incorrect against the fish, uh, and it's just unnecessary to try to be playing like. Uh, multiple streets of like you know poker where we're bluffing a ton against these types of players. Uh, on the same note, we almost want to be more inclined to take some free cards with our draws just because it's going to be in spots where like say we bet the flop with a nice draw and we brick on the turn. They're just rarely going to be folding and we lose a lot of equity in the pot when uh, the turn bricks. So we should just be much more inclined to take the free card against them instead of barreling and allowing ourselves, if we hit, to get value on the river, where we know we can still make a large bet on the river and get paid off by a lot of hands, especially after we checked uh, the turn. One of the things you'll hear me talk about every once in a while is you want to be Mr. Nice Guy to the fish. Uh, and I see this way too often where people get sucked out on or a fish plays a hand like you know, if you saw my first video, a guy called a 4-bet with queen-10, and I 4-bet with queens, and the flop came 10-10-something, and he stacked me. I mean, there's no reason to braid a fish when this happens. There, we don't want to discourage uh, these horrible plays. We, If anything, we want to encourage them. So, you know, the last thing you want to do is braid or trash, uh, talk trash to the fish. There are a few players you can talk trash to, um, and those are players that, like, the tag knits that, like, Tilt really easily for some reason. Those aren't. Those are pretty good people actually to, tra uh, to trash talk. However, the fish are not the guys you want to make uh, uncomfortable at the table because the last thing you want is the fish leaving, and the second last thing you want is the fish trying to play better. All right, we want them playing maybe even worse. You know, so compliment their plays uh, when they make a bad. You know, compliment them or say nothing when they make a bad play. Say nice hand or say I like the way you play that or something along those lines instead of. Uh, saying, you donk, you fish, how could you call there, don't you know what your pot odds were? I mean, all those things are just awful to say. And, like, when I see people at the table I'm at and there's a big fish sitting and, like, they're talking trash to them, I want to, like, somehow internet slap them. I don't even know how you would do it. But they should really not be allowed to play poker anymore if they're trying to educate the fish. That's just, like, the dumbest thing ever. And I guess I use this a couple minutes to go on a rant on that. But I think you just really want to be nice to the fish, make him feel comfortable, allow him to continue playing poorly, and you'll eventually win your money. The last thing about adjusting to the fish is going to be you want to be very careful when you're facing aggression from the fish. Uh, we know these players tend to call down very light. However, they don't tend to raise too much unless they have the goods. Okay, So uh, if they're only raising or betting very strong hands, we want to be giving them credit in a lot of spots uh, where we might not normally give credit. You know, If, if some kind of weird draw comes in, uh, one we think a tag or lag would never have in a certain spot, it's more than likely the fish can have it. And they typically have the hand they're representing. And I see a lot of people um, just not giving enough credit to players like fish who have very wide ranges, who can call with any two cards in the flop or turn, and then when certain weird kind of draws come in, they still call down. All right, we really want to make sure that um, against your typical uh, fish that you give credit in spots where they're being aggressive and they generally have a very strong range for raising. All right, so the fish is definitely a player who we should be winning a ton of money off of. And as long as you take these adjustments into consideration, uh, there's just no reason why you shouldn't be able uh, to exploit their tendencies and go ahead and win a lot of money from them. So the last person on our list is going to be the maniac, 
and who's an extension of the fish, but just a more aggressive fish. And he's probably the most frustrating player in poker, and that's the reason why we need to look more into him and discuss how we can beat him. To help us break down the maniac, I brought my good friend in, Matt Foley, the motivational speaker. Um, to, when talking about a maniac, we're, like we've talked about earlier slides, we're discussing a player who's playing a large, large, large amount of hands before the flop and playing them also aggressively. This is where they differ from a maniac, I mean from a regular fish. Where the regular fish is playing a wide range but playing it passively, the maniac tends to play very loose aggressive, um, both pre-flop and post-flop. So... Uh, they're playing aggressive from all positions, whereas a typical fish is probably limping in an early position a lot, the maniac is raising. Where a typical fish might be just calling a lot from the blinds, the maniac is re-raising. Uh, because of this, they tend to three-bet a lot pre-flop, they tend to get into some really big battles, uh, and they just tend to have very wide ranges for doing so. Uh, and they tend to play post-flop uh, in a manner where they're stacking off with basically any time, any pair, any draw uh, is good enough flop for them to stack off with. So uh, this is just a player who uh, is willing to give us his money uh, with a very wide range of hands. Uh, this player also has, obviously has a very high bluffing frequencies, whereas against your typical fish or tag, you're, you're going to have you know the rate, the way you weight their range on later streets is going to be much more for value when they're raising or betting compared to bluffs. It's much opposite with the maniac, uh, where he's going to be tend to be bluffing a lot more than he's value betting uh, on later streets. Uh, this goes from preflop, where they're you know willing to get the money in really really light preflop. I've seen maniacs get you know it in with jack high and you know bad aces and hands like suited connectors all the time preflop. Um, and people really aren't willing to stack off with them for some reason. Uh, and the ones that do just accept the variance and keep on playing. Uh, and then post-flop, they semi-bluff obviously a ton. They're willing to stack off with any draw. But on top of that, they also make a ton of zero equity bluffs. And what I mean by that is they're bluffing with no chance to win the pot other than taking the pot down with their bluff. And we know that's a pretty incorrect way to bluff. Um, whereas when we're bluffing, we're typically semi-bluffing and we have a decent amount of equity if we happen to be called. So now that we've broken him down, let's talk about ways to adjust uh, to the maniac. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I can give most people is just try to remain patient. Uh, this player, he will eventually donate his chips. Right? He's going to give his chips away. This player rarely quits, even when he's way ahead. He's just going to keep playing wildly aggressive and eventually go bust. So knowing that, you just have to remain patient and wait for strong hands and then get in spots against him where he's going to stack off way too light. Uh, you're going to have to show a little bit of discipline in some spots and avoid very high variance spots. That might that might mean even though a hand like Queen Jack could be a like a very, very, very tiny favorite against like his all in range preflop, it's better to fold a hand like that and wait for a bigger edge to exploit. And I know most people would say you should be trying to exploit every little tiny edge you have. Um, however, in in the hopes of you know keeping him around the table and also allowing him to remain like really aggressive, I'm gonna tend to fold like some of those very very borderline hands. But like I'm not gonna fold a hand like King Queen against this guy because it holds a lot more equity than a hand like Queen Jack. Uh, we really want to exploit their over aggressiveness though as much as we can. Uh, and I kind of put my screen name in here uh, as LOL trapped you. Basically this is a great this is the perfect player to trap. And most people uh, are always really scared when they get into pots with these kind of players, uh, and they just try to get the money in as quickly as possible. And that's just not the way to do it. Like, the way they play, they're already protecting our hand for us because they're betting so much and so frequently that it's not really like we're missing chances to charge and to draw out against us because they're always just betting every single street, and they're almost betting our hand for us. Um, so we want to let them do that. Instead of call, instead of raising a lot post flop, we want to be rarely raising post flop, uh, and we and we want to allow them to bluff off all their money to us. And that's just a big difference from what I see normal people playing the maniacs. They get into these raising wars with them post flop, and these guys have such a wide and weak range that uh, they're gonna you're gonna be making them fold way too much if you're constantly raising them post flop. Instead, you can take some really passive lines and just call them down with some very strong hands and just own them in the sense that 
they're going to be just like three barrel bluffing a ton and we can just keep calling with our over pair or our top pair top kicker or our set or our two pair or whatever and just allow them to do what they want to do which is to put all the money in with a very bad hand for some reason they feel like that's a great way to play poker is to build really really big pots with really bad hands and there's no reason why we shouldn't just let them do that I see way too many people encouraging them to play better by raising and letting them fold like on earlier streets uh, and a little bit of high variance play is the next point but it's going to be to make some lighter call downs uh, you know hands were against a tag or even the fish you'd be folding uh, we need to give the maniac a lot a lot less credit and we need to call hands we would normally fold uh, hands like top pair uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to fold against a maniac, but we want to make sure we're doing it correctly when we're when we're calling down, right? Like we talked about, we want to be trapping them in a sense where we don't want to be raising and uh, stacking off maybe on the flop with a hand like top pair, where our opponent's going to fold a ton of his bluffs and then is going to only stack off with a semi-decent hand range. We just want to be constantly calling these players down, allowing them to bluff, allowing them to just spew chips into us. And hands like top pair or like a slide over pair are good hands to do that against. I see way too many people um, like having a uh, having a really good read that an opponent's a maniac, but then just wanting to fold top pair. It's just you're never going to convince me that that's going to be a solid play to fold top pair against a really uh, bad, loose, aggressive player. Just because we know that if we look at our equity in the pot against all of his possible hands, that uh, we're going to come out on top a lot of the time. Okay, so now that we've talked about every single type, uh, let's just draw some conclusions as we finish this lecture up before I get into the live play segment. Uh, and let's just kind of take one topic from each person, from each player, and we'll discuss them. So against the tags, we really want to do our best to get them out of their comfort zone. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in earlier slides where we want to get tags to play more out of position against us, whether that is making smaller raises from late position when they're in the blinds, uh, or making smaller 3-bet sizes, like the most you should be 3-betting a tag when you're in position against them is like 3x. Uh, it would be pretty incorrect. Otherwise, uh, you know, we don't need to be building a big pot against a strong range preflop. We want to be keeping the pot somewhat in control, but forcing them to play some 3-bet pots out of position against us, or making them just fold a lot preflop. Okay, against the lags, we want to play strong positionally aware poker. Uh, we talked about seat selections, very important when dealing with the laggier players, where uh, we don't really want to be sitting on the right ever because they're just going to own us. But if we sit on their left a lot and take away some of their positional advantage, or pretty much all their positional advantage, we can start easily beating up on the lag. Uh, because now we're playing a strong hand range and we're playing it in position. And even though he might be a pretty good hand reader and might be, you know, use aggression uh, properly, it's still going to be almost impossible for him to play profitably out of position against us when we have a very strong hand range. Uh, so that's probably the best way to beat the lag. Uh, the best way to beat the fish is just going to be to go for value. You know, three bet for value a lot pre-flop, um, widen your three betting range maybe possibly, and then post-flop definitely gain multiple streets of value where you normally wouldn't against like tags or nits. Whereas we talked about uh, taking proper pot control lines against the tags or nits is probably correct. However, against the fish, it's just not going to be that great. When they're going to be calling down really, really light with second and third pair, even ace high a lot of the times I see it. Uh, we really want to make sure that we are owning that tendency and exploiting it by widening our range for value betting. And finally, the maniacs is the guy we just talked about. And uh, the main way to exploit them is to let them bluff us, right? Uh, they love bluffing us. That's their style. They're either some someone drunk that just got their paycheck cashed or just a person that likes to bully other people. And uh, that's great. What we can do is, we, like we talked about, we remain patient, we show some discipline, and when we finally flop a strong hand, or a hand good enough against their range to call down with, we don't fold. And we, but we don't raise as well. We just let them continue to bluff us, and we just exploit their tendency to want to be the table bully, and to want to try to uh, just blow everybody out of the pot, and we eventually just own them uh, by calling them down somewhat light, and just having them show us bluffs time and time again. All right, so I hope I uh, covered the majority of uh, players and the majority of like player types and ways to adjust and exploit them uh, in this lecture. What I'll do is I'll 
do another hour long video where hopefully we run into some different player types. You know, it's not always a guarantee when you're playing, but I'll try to find some different types of players, whether it's nits, tags, fish, or maniacs, and we can hopefully see some post flop and pre flop situations where uh, we can use these adjustments to exploit a lot of their tendencies. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed all these lectures. Certainly enjoyed them myself making them. I learned a lot as well as uh, hopefully got you guys uh, opening your minds up a little bit, and hopefully you got a lot from them as well. All right, guys, this was Spinda for GraduateSchool.com. You guys take it easy.